All right, I want to welcome on my next guest. We've got a very special guest. We've got longtime NFL coach and legendary CFL coach. We've got Mr. Mark Trespin. Mark, how's everything going for you? Fantastic, Zach. It's it's great to be with you today. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for taking the time. So we're, we're so we're 11 weeks into the NFL season. Did you see it going as, quote unquote, smoothly as it has? Uh, I did not. Uh, it, you have to really, uh, you know, give... Uh, credos to the NFL and the way they've handled it. It's, um, it's so many levels, so many layers, so complicated, and you're dealing with the health of players and their families. Uh, you know, somehow they've been able to legitimize the season uh, and, uh, you know, create some interest, you know, obviously some fan interest outside of the stadiums. Who's been the team that's kind of caught your eye more than anyone else? Uh, you know, I've, I've got to say uh, Cleveland has Interesting. Uh, in the way they've kind of turned things around. I think culturally they're in a really good place. And um, I really like their staff and what they're doing there. I think John Gruden's done a heck of a job. I know their record isn't quite what, you know, last night's game. But I think that, you know, in, in Oakland right now, I think they believe they can beat anybody. And that's really good in just the second year. And, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm still intrigued by the, the Chargers. I know their record isn't what – you know, you, you would want it to be, and I'm a big Anthony Lynn fan and believe it, and I coached him at San Francisco, but um, I, I certainly see a turnaround coming there with, with the play of uh, Herbert. Did you see Herbert breaking out as quickly as he, as he has or no? I can't say I knew enough about him coming out, um, but I, I'm excited about where he is, yeah. and I think that, um, you know, the growth of Josh Allen in Buffalo, yeah. uh, I think that's a really credit to you know, Sean and the culture, Dable and the, the system of football and really utilizing his skill set. He's playing with tremendous confidence. Absolutely. So I want, so I want to ask you a little about your, your career. So I understand that you played behind Tony Dungy at the University of Minnesota. That's probably my claim to fame as a, as a, as a person. I, at least I, that's what I, <laughs> I call it. Um, you know, we just happen to be there at the same time. And, um, you know, t Tony certainly made an impression on me, the type of person he was there, his character and his... Uh, his work ethic was, um, you know, was, uh, you know, over the top in terms of, and the fun part there is we didn't know at the time, but we were, we were recruited and played for Tom Moore, you know, who was, you know, the, a legendary coordinator and was the coordinator for Tony in, in, uh, in Indianapolis for 10 years and was part of certainly Peyton Manning's growth as a player. What was coaching something you wanted to do for a long time or did well, it kind of, no? I, in fact, I never really looked at coaching, um, as a profession at all. Um, I love the game of football, was passionate about it since I was a young kid and wanted to play as long as I could. Um, I got cut a couple times from the Vikings. And um, during that time, I started law school at the University of Miami. And, uh, you know, but for a coincidence, I would have been a lawyer today. So how, how did you make the full-time pivot into coaching from studying law? Well, I, I had no idea I was going to do it. I was studying for exams and, and, uh, you know, I do believe there's no such thing as a coincidence and the universe works a certain way. So there were really two events that changed everything for me it was studying for exams, going out to the, cook some chicken and running it in one of the uh, University of Miami coaches, which happened to be in 1979-80 uh, when Howard Schnellenberg had taken over. Jim Kelly was the quarterback and Bernie Kosar was about to come in. And uh, one thing led to another and I was volunteering. I, I became a coach. And then, uh, you know, seven years later, I got out of coaching. I was out of coaching for three years and all of a sudden, you know, Steve, I was watching Steve Young and Jerry Rice play in the Super Bowl um, at Joe Robbie Stadium now at Hard Rock. And um, three days later, I was the coordinator uh, for the 49ers having been out of football for three years. I had no control over any of it, but uh, I really believe the universe took me back to football. What were you doing during that three years? I was managing municipal bond portfolios for private investors. A little bit different. Just a little bit different. A little bit different. <laughs> All in place for Steve Young. It was a little bit different. And then, so how, how did the how did the kind of um, the wheels fall into you ending up with San Fran? Um, that's a long story, more than the podcast has time for. <laughs> but it, it was certainly a complete coincidence of a number of things taking place over a period of about a month. Um, usually, when you're not thinking about it, you're not trying to do it. You're not trying to connect dots. The dots connect for you. And that's basically what happened. That's awesome. I saw you guys led the NFL in scoring that year in these offenses. Oh, we, we did. That's, that's incredible. So what, what was that experience like after being out of coaching for a couple of years, being removed as just a volunteer, and all of a sudden now you're coaching one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time? You know, it was um, really, uh, in fact, I just, I just uh, 
you know, did an interview. They're 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 replaying uh, the 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 49ers versus the Vikings in 1995 uh, on the Monday night game before the 49ers play, and they wanted me to look at um, that game. I had forgotten everything. I mean, I don't. Really, it's, it's really like it. It's like with everything else in your life. It really is a dream. I mean, Steve Young threw for 400 yards that night, and Steve Young had uh, and Jerry Rice had over 250 yards and catches. And honestly, I didn't remember any of it other than the unique part about that moment was after the game, Tony was coaching the defense for the Vikings at the time. And we, we, we talked after the game, but even I remembering when we talked, I never thought about the win or, or the accomplishments, individual stats or accomplishments of the game. We were just moving on to Atlanta the next, the, the final week. That's awesome. And then, so is that what kind of solidified you Is it kind of like a, like a QB guru per se? Cause is that, I feel like that's, a lot of a lot of what I was reading from from there on, you just had un, unmag- unimaginable successes with every quarterback you were working with. Well, I don't know about that. I think it's the other way around myself. Um, you know, I was fortunate that I got involved in football at the University of Miami when I didn't coach Jim Kelly, but I was there when he started. But I did have a chance to coach Bernie Kosar yeah. and Vinny Testaverde. So when you you know, it, it's 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 very very you know, there's a parallel between you know winding up coaching in a place where there's a quarterback who's very good and being perceived as somebody that you're probably less of than people think of you. And that's Mm -hmm. kind of how I look at it. I love coaching ball. I love coaching quarterbacks. Always have. I love the quarterback room, but I've been blessed with, uh, you know, walking the path with some really good quarterbacks. And when they were, when quarterbacks I've coached have played well, I've been given a lot of credit more than I might do. And when quarterbacks haven't played well, I've been fired. That's really how it works. I have a question. How quickly after watching a quarterback practice for 15 minutes, can you tell if this guy's got it or he doesn't? I, I think that's really hard. I think there's so much that goes into uh, the, the position of playing the game and playing at a high level and being able to do things you need to do. There's, there needs to be a lot more work. If it was that easy, um, you know, teams wouldn't miss on quarterbacks as much as yeah. they do because they miss more than they, they're right. Interesting. And then, so how did you end up with the Lions after your time in San Francisco? Well, that was... Um, you know, I had crossed paths with one of the Lions coaches, Jerry. Uh, uh, let me just see. Let me see if I can explain this. Um, Bobby Ross was the head coach. In fact, the, the unique part about that, they had lost in the Super Bowl. Um, they had lost in the Super Bowl or he had lost his job the year after this, two years after the Super Bowl, and he became the head coach of the Lions. And on that staff were two coaches I knew really well, the offensive coordinator, Sylvester Karum, and, uh, and Jerry Sullivan, the receiver coach. And they introduced me to Bobby. Bobby interviewed me and offered me the job. Oh, cool. And then what was your, what was your experience like there? Because I've got it right here. It says you, you helped Scott Mitchell pass for 3,400 yards, which is insane. Well, I was really lucky. Scott was um, a quarterback you don't hear much about. No. You know, he had a couple of good games with Miami and got the big contract with, with uh, Detroit. Uh, the year before I got there, Detroit led the league in offense anyways. And Scott was a tremendous passer, Um, very, very accurate. We had Herman Moore, we had Johnny Morton there, we had a really good tight end, and we had we had uh, Barry Sanders. So we had a great offense, and and Scott was like most great quarterbacks, and he was underrated in my opinion. Extremely hardworking, took care of his body, detailed, and and just an accurate passer. You know, so that was a great experience, and. The only reason I left is because Bobby said you need to get back on track as a coordinator. So the following year, I had a ch- I, I could have stayed in Detroit or gone to Buffalo with Wade Phillips or or Arizona, and we decided to, to head for the warm weather and coach Jake Plummer. I have a, one more question about Detroit. Did you was Lomas Brown the left tackle when you were there? He was. I actually interviewed him. He was one. I actually did. Um, did you know he 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 used to be a trombone player? Did he ever tell you about that? I did not know that. Yeah, so he, he was telling me apparently in high school he was the biggest trombone guy in the band, and the principal <laughs> pulled him out and said, you're going to go play football, and then everything happened. Yeah, so, great, yeah. great high-character guy. Really, Absolutely. Good. Uh, do, do you think it's a shame he's not in the Hall of Fame yet? Um, you know, I can't comment at that. I'm, I don't have his whole story in front of me, Yeah, but he certainly played. I mean, we played very well as an offense. Barry right. had 2,000 years. He was 2,000 yards that year, and, and, uh, and, and Scott had a very good year. You know, we, we were a very good offense running the ball and throwing it. And, uh, but that was my only year there. So I really can't comment, but Lomas was certainly a big factor yeah. in that. And then, so going to, going to the desert, how, how did you help reinvent, um, with, um, Jake Plummer? Well, I think that, uh, you know, Jake had a lot of inherent qualities. He was, I, I consider him a real ice man. He could play under pressure. 
but we were a very average offense my first year in 1998 for halfway through the season. And we had a great defense. And I really owe it to Vince Tobin, who was the head coach and a defensive coordinator. And Vince walked in the office and said, we can win here with this offense, but we can't win a championship and go to the playoffs. We got to open it up. And so we did. We went to a no huddle offense, very similar to what uh, Buffalo had run for years with Jim Kelly. And we're throwing it a lot. And we had a really good solid running back in Adrian Morrell who could catch the football. And, uh, and we just started throwing it. Jake threw for, I, th- I want to say, 2,500 yards in eight games. And we were able to go into Dallas, you know, and win the first playoff game that, that Arizona had won in 51 years. And, uh, that was on the road in Dallas, beating a really good Dallas team. Yeah. So um, Jake is, was a special guy. He was very quiet, but very, very tough. Like, like again, like, like quarterbacks who have the it factor, he had it. I mean, he – you knew that when he was on the field, you had a chance. And in the last eight games, probably five of them were won in the last two minutes. Wow. With Jake getting us in a position to win. That's incredible. And then so going to Oakland, if I would have told you right when you started in Oakland that um, Rich Gannon would go on to win most valuable player, what would you have said? Well, I think, um, you know, I knew Rich because I was with the Vikings when we, when we, when we uh, traded for Rich in the okay. draft. And so I coached Rich for a couple of years in in Minnesota. When I had gotten to Oakland, Rich had been there for a couple years and John Gruden had done a really good job with him. Um, When John left after the Tuck season and took the head job in in uh, in Tampa, I was fortunate enough, Bill Callahan, who was the line coach, hired me to be the coordinator and we worked together. And really we kind of reinvented the offense. And, and Bill is a line coach. Most people know football, no line coaches. Oh, are yeah. more, they want to run the ball and they yep. want, and Bill looked at our offense and said, we're going to be able to run the ball, but what our line can do is pass protect. So, you know, we did things that year. We probably threw the ball far more. We, we were doing things in 2002 that teams do now. They wow. throw it first. Um, we had a good play action game. And in the first game, we, we ran it over 60 times against Seattle in our first N1. And you, said ran, you said ran it 60 times? Yeah, we ran it 60 times twice during the season, our first and our last game. Um, but the second game of the season, we went to Pittsburgh to play on a Sunday or a Monday night. And we threw it. We actually told the players we were going to throw it more than any team had thrown it in NFL history. And we did. We only ran it one time in the first half. <laughs> and, uh, and and we scored on a, on a draw play to, uh, to, um, to Charlie Garner. And uh, so – you know, we started becoming a throwing team in the in the AFC Championship game. I think we threw it the first 27 of 29 times, and we were just going to throw the ball because we felt we could we could keep Rich clean. Yeah. And uh, and 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 I've always felt that first down is is critical, and we were a magnificent team on first down because we were averaging over six and a half yards per play. That's awesome. And then, so ha- I have a question. So fast forward, how did you end up in the CFL? Um, well. Uh, a couple, again, a lot of, a lot of things happen in your life that determine that. So um, I had decided after leaving the Dolphins, uh, we got fired there um, after Jim Bates took over that I was going to get out of the NFL. My daughters were in junior high and high school in junior high. And I promised them that they were going to stay. We were going to stay in Raleigh where I had taken a job as coordinator at NC state. And I was there two years and then Chuck Amato and our staff got fired. So I was out of football with two years left. And I, I spent the summer uh, in training camp with the, with the Saints. Um, but when I left there, um, I got a call from Jim Pop, who was the general manager of the Montreal Alouettes. And I had forgotten that back in 1989, Jim, Joe Pop was coaching with the Browns where I was a coordinator. And Jim Pop was his son and Jim came to practice and his father, Joe, asked me if Jim could hang out with us. So Jim hung out with us for two weeks. I gave him a playbook. He was in meetings to make a long story short. 20 years later, he called me, said, Mark, I see you're out of work. I followed your career. I'm the general manager of the Alouettes and we've interviewed some guys, but I think it's time you become a head coach because I hadn't been and wanted to that you should interview for the job. So they flew me to Montreal. I interviewed for the job. And the next day he called me back and he said, the owner wants to hire you. Are you interested? I said, I, we need to talk a little bit more. We did. And it was one of the greatest moments of my life and, and five of the most exciting 
and, and, and genuinely fulfilling yeah. my years in my coaching career. How many different times have you moved for a coaching guy? Cause I was, you're going all over the map here. An enormous, an enormous, <laughs> an enormous. I mean, I, I want to say that we moved 10 to 12 times, wow. you know, early on. So we probably have moved 15 times overall. Unbelievable. Landlords and, and people probably were not too happy with you. Well, um, it goes to, you know, <laughs> your spouse who is, yeah. is, is, is staying behind to sell yeah. everything and move everything and move the kids. And it's your spouse while you're working, who is, you know, um, you know, she's the one who yeah. is, is, uh, is finding the veterinarians and the grocery stores and the play dates and all those things. So, you know, uh, without my wife having done what she did, yeah. I don't think it would have been possible. It's awesome. So I, I want to talk about the bears. So how, how did that, how did that come into fruition? The, uh, sure. going, ending up in Chicago. That's a good question. So after five years in the CFL, you know, people would ask, do you want to go back to the NFL and be a head coach? Well, that was my ultimate dream, but I was focused on being the best head coach that I could. Okay. And I really never thought about it because during your career, you aspire, you think, well, if this guy gets a GM job or this guy gets this job, he, he'll at least get, give you an interview for a job and you'll have a chance. Well, that's kind of what happened with Jim Pop, but it was a fluke. Yeah. And then I get a call from Phil Emery, who was the new general manager of the Bears, and I did not know Phil ever. I had never met him. I didn't know anybody in the Bear organization, nobody. And I'd been in the NFL for a long time, but wow. I knew nobody. And he said, I'd like to interview for the head coaching job. And I said, it would be a privilege and an honor. And we met. And uh, the next thing you know, he calls me and he said, uh, uh, do you want the job? Uh, the McCaskies have approved you. And um, I said, absolutely. And then two days later or the next day, I'm in, I'm in Chicago. So, so I'm looking at, so I've got a couple of comments from people. Some of them, I don't like the questions, but some of them were, so one of them was actually very interesting. What, what changed between the offense in your first year and your second year? Cause the first year I saw you guys started eight and six, you had a terrific offense, um, came in second division. What, what changed in that off season? Well, you're right. We had, uh, we had, a, you know, a tremendous season overall offense. It was, I think it's, it's considered the number one offense in, in, in bear history. Wow. Uh, but in the second year, a lot of things happen. You're not, you're not, your time of possession isn't what you needed to be because your defense isn't playing well. You, you've got a team full of injuries, yeah. and and uh, and we had a lot of that. And and you know, I have, I've always held myself accountable for that um, because injuries are part of the game. And uh, you know, I was never able to uh, you know get the defense to play at the level that they needed yeah. to play. And and offensively, we we did some good things, but we did it. Um, we didn't, we didn't have the players that we had uh, the year before. If, if you could do, excuse me, if you could do your bears tenure over again, would you do anything differently? Well, that's a great question because there's been a lot of misperceptions about yeah. it. I think we were going the right way culturally. I think we were going the right way in the locker room. I think that if you ask certain people about how it went, they will, they would tell the listener that the locker room was the issue. To me, the locker room was going in the right direction. They just asked the wrong people which way to opt. And, 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 and I, I think there, there was some insidiousness in that area um, that I could have done a better job, you know, controlling and taking care of, and I didn't. Um, but um, just going back to your question, um, that's a great question for Bill Belichick because he got a second opportunity and Pete Carroll got a second opportunity and Tom Coughlin got a second opportunity. So it's, it's, you know, guys, things happen. You have to have everything working right. And we had a lot of good things working right up into game 16 of our, my first year when we were winning the game and, and, and uh, you know, Rogers completed four fourth down plays to beat us. Right. So there's a lot of things that changed everything or we were playing the 49ers in a playoff game that week. And in the second year, we just, a lot of things were not going in our favor. And without going into detail, people have asked, oh, so I'm accountable for those things. I didn't get those things done. And um, there's some coaches who got the next job that got four years that didn't win as many games. And, you know, that's just how it goes. It's, it's, it's sometimes it's just, that's the game. Um, and um, the, the things I would do different. There's a lot of them. There always are, but the, the foundation of how we were building it, I think we were going in the right way. Do you think Bears fans now are giving Matt Nagy a hard time? Oh, I, I think that whether you're the football coach there, the basketball coach or the hockey coach, none of who, when I was there, have their jobs today. Um, 
listen, there's no better sports town than Chicago. No. There may be as good, but there's no yeah. better. Uh, people love their teams. And, uh, you know, that's certainly part of the frustration is, you know, but that I, we did the best we could. We got an opportunity. Um, my feeling will always be that we didn't get enough of a chance, the chance that others got. And that I think if the right people would have had a chance to give their opinion on the direction that we were going, I think things might have diff been different. But I've completely moved on. Uh, because I don't define myself by wins and losses. I define myself by how I help men yeah. become better fathers, husbands, and teammates, because I think that leads to winning eventually. Who do you think won the Khalil Mack trade? Well, that, that's a hard one on me because I wasn't there. You know, I mean, I, I think the bottom line is, is that certainly, I mean, the strength is the Chicago Bears as the defense, yeah. right? And it's hard to argue that the Las Vegas Raiders aren't going in the right direction. Yeah. But we've seen now their, their defense needs to get better. Yeah. Uh, but their offense is headed in the right direction. And I think that'll be uh, the next phase for the growth of their team. But what they've shown is they're as good as any team in the division. And the season is not even just a little over half over. So, you know, they continue to get yeah. better and they showed it last night. They're still, they're a very good football team and a team to be reckoned with. And then so I have a question. So during your um, tenure in the NFL, who was one quarterback that you didn't get the chance to work with that you would have loved and you thought would have been great for your system? Oh, God, there's there's I mean, I think that um, the one thing I do believe in the system and, you know, I've, I've gotten enough feedback from the coaches, the players that I've worked with is the system. And, and I think I think if you look at the quarterback ratings, yeah. the quarterbacks are getting some fantastic yeah. coaching. There's no doubt about it because they've been the quarterbacks have never been more productive. Probably if you, you look at yeah. it over the years, this may be the year of years and maybe that's part of no training camp and no tackling and yeah. all the other things that go on, but that's hard to say. I mean, um, I have so much admiration for the position. It's so hard to play that I would love to coach and feel a privilege to coach anybody. I mean, there's, there's probably 26 quarterbacks right now in the NFL that any head coach would want. Maybe really? more yeah. if you break them down. And there's only a few coaches are really looking for better because there's not a team. There's really 26 to 28 teams that can actually win a championship with the quarterbacks that are playing for them now. And I don't, I think that's hard to disagree with. Who do, who's one of the quarterbacks in the league that's not getting a lot of fanfare that you see a lot and that you think has a bright future? Well, um, boy, that, that's, a, that's a tough question because they're all getting fanfare. I yeah. mean, just go down the West coast who can't play. I mean, yeah. Derek Carr is playing as fast and as confidently as he's ever played. You know, and all those quarterbacks right down the line. I mean, I had the privilege of recruiting Russell Wilson. So, you know, I followed him. I forgot he was there when you were there. Wow. Well, I, I didn't get a chance to coach him, but I got a chance okay. to him and sign him. But, um, you know, the whole West Coast is field. I have not a, a chance to see Drew Locke play very much, you know. But if you go right down, you know, through the Midwest, I mean, and I'm, I'm a Foles fan. So if you add Foles to it, yeah. you know, who wouldn't you want to coach right down the middle of the country? And look at what Tannehill's done. That's a, that's a great story. I mean, he was brilliant in the last drive uh, the other day. So that's an interesting one. You know, Roethlisberger's at his peak. Um, you know, Wentz isn't playing at the level he needs to play. And, you know, I appreciate the fact that, that Doug is, is, is rallied around him. Um, you know, I think, I think that Jones has a chance to be a really good player. So go right down the coast again, you know. Um, I'd love to coach Alex Smith. I think he's a heck of a player. Even even at this point, you, you yeah, think? I think he's a servant. I mean, he's a Rich Gannon kind of player. Okay. But, you know, he's not a guy that I I would say you know can can have the weight of the organization on his shoulders. But when you play a game with him, you know you have hope. He's not going to give give the game away, right? Yeah. So and and you look what's going down in Miami and Tampa and. And who wouldn't want to coach Matt Ryan? And so it's a great league with great quarterbacks. And, you know, you know, you watch, you watch Rogers. There's nobody better than him. He, he probably makes it look other than Mahomes. Yeah. Um, who's still got to do it for a longer period of time. Yeah. You know, Rogers probably makes it look easier than anybody else. And, you know, I watched Kurt Cousins play last week. He was, he played a, a great game. You yeah. know, I didn't see the whole game, but I saw a lot of it. Thought he played great. So, uh, if you love the NFL, you can't have the NFL without quarterbacks. And right now, they, the NFL's got them. So there's two quarterbacks right now that I think are going to be on different teams next year. I want, I'm curious who you're higher on, Sam Darnold or Dwayne Haskins. I'm higher on Darnold. Um, 
I'm not as high on Haskins, but in a, in a, in a system, you know, that's not, that's not to say he couldn't be. Um, I've just, I've just watched Darnold enough, uh, but Darnold's got to, he's got to be a healthy player. I mean, you know, that's the hard part for him when he's played well, he's shown flashes of greatness, but the injuries have really inhibited, you know, somebody's going to take a chance on him. The injuries are going to be a factor in what they're going to pay. Yeah. And I've got one last question for you. So, so you, you coaching the XFL, how did, how did that come into fruition? And then what happened when you found out that the, the league was kind of, right. it's a great, it's a great question, Zach. Yeah. So the XFL was, was tremendous. It was done first class in every way. Um, it had an owner in Vince McMahon who allowed, gave us all the resources we needed. Um, we, we was all first class and our commissioner Oliver Luck did a tremendous job with, with help from a, a really good staff around him to put the lead together. I had the privilege of working with seven other coaches. They were awesome. You know, for seven, eight months, we put the league first. And then when we had our draft and got our teams, then we started competing. Um, and, and, and it was just a blast to coach. Um, it came to an end because two guys in LA got the virus and a day later they shut it down. Um, and, and it went, but when we left, and I, I think when most teams left, we all thought we were, we had, we were in a position to win because every team was starting to play really well halfway through the season. And it was a highly competitive league. Um, but that's where we left it. You know, that was it. You know, we, um, I think that if the league would have prevailed and the pandemic wouldn't have been there, um, you know, I'm sick for not only the players who had an opportunity. Again, I, after coaching the CFL, these players are literally a credit card width yeah. of, of playing in the NFL. That's how good they are. Yeah. Right. PJ Walker just beat Detroit yesterday. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And in my opinion, some people will say he was the best quarterback in the league. I don't know that he was, but he was really good. Believe me. I mean, yeah. he deserved an opportunity. So, um, and I'm, I couldn't be more excited for him because he had a great, great season. Yeah. Um, so the league provides an opportunity. Um, I liked it because I had a chance to build an organization yeah. and give a lot of people a chance to have a job and work in football yeah. and develop them. And uh, for I, I heard for them more than anything. Do you have any? I, heard, I saw that Dwayne Johnson's involved with it now, and they're trying to bring it back up in a couple of years. Do you have any interest in in, in going back to it? It's when a possibility. Like they're talking to all of us right now, and. You know, they're going to onboard this thing probably in the next three months, oh, cool. you know, start hiring staffs and things like that and getting oh, cool. it'll be very similar to the year before. Yeah, I'm not sure at this time I'll be a part of it, um, but I'm, I'm certainly going to do everything I can to help them succeed because I want to see these kids have an opportunity to play yeah. um, and not only to make a living, but, you know, to develop and maybe at, at some point in time, uh, independent of the NFL, have an opportunity to, to play like some guys are, some guys in our team are you're on practice squads and things yeah. and I'm excited for the time they'll get an opportunity. Yeah. And then the last thing I want to ask you is, as I understand you wrote, you wrote a, wrote a book a couple of years ago and can you talk about that a little bit and how people, people want to check it out? Yeah. Well, I, I wrote a book called perseverance. It came out in 2010. Okay. And it's really a, it's a, it's a semi autobiography on leadership lessons. And I've kind of parlayed that into um, I'm going to teach a law school course at the university of Miami law school in January and February. Oh, cool. Um, I'm going to code. I'm going to co-teach it with uh, Peter Carfania, who is, uh, a Harvard law professor and uh, the, the, the head of the sports track of the sports and entertainment law uh, track at the University of Miami Law School, which I graduated from. Yeah. So um, I'm going to use that book kind of as a core. But, um, you know, it was a book I really wrote, Zach, you know, so my kids would have something. Um, I didn't really worry about how many books it would sell or anything like that and haven't really paid much attention to it. Um, but it was a time when I was out of football during that time prior to getting the job in Montreal, where I decided to sit down and look back at my life and see if I could make some changes to make, you know, the job that is a tough job more fulfilling. And it was able to allow me to do that. Yeah, well, that's awesome. Well, that's all the questions I really have for you. I really do appreciate you taking the time to chat. This has been a blast. Zach, it's my pleasure. I'm glad I could help.